afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Clemens Center and the Strauss Center for, and the LBJ School for sponsoring this event. I want to thank Jacqueline Chandler, who's escaping the room, and uh, Jessica Mahoney for all of their uh, wonderful staff work. It is a really great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, my friend and someone whose work I've long admired, uh, Michael Misha Auslin. Uh, he's a really extraordinary figure. He's someone who manages to be a serious scholar, a true public intellectual, a policy expert, and a fun guy at the same time. And there aren't many people who can fit that Venn diagram, and Misha is certainly one of them. At, the time, at, at this moment, he's the resident scholar and director of Japan Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. I like to think of him as director of Asia Strategy Studies. <laughs> You should call yeah. yourself that. I, I'm going to after today. You are Asian for <laughs> strategy. I know Misha from our time at Yale. Uh, he was an associate professor of history at Yale. And in addition to his many, many writings that I know you've read in the Wall Street Journal, the National Review, and many other publications, he is the author of two superb books that I recommend to you, two books I have read and that I can say are worth your reading. And some of you will have them on your comps lists, Kazushi, to read. <laughs> Uh, one, and negotiating with imperialism, the unequal treaties, and the culture of Japanese diplomacy is truly the best book on U.S.-Japanese relations in the late 1850s. At this moment, when Japan is going through major transformations, and in Misha's terms, developing a new approach to diplomacy, it's still the Tokugawa period, and a period we often overlook as we go right into the Meiji period. For me, that was a truly eye-opening book. And then he, more recently, in 2011, published Pacific Cosmopolitans, autobiographical in some ways, in a, way, a in cultural a way. history of U.S.-Japanese uh, relations, which wonderfully spans from the 19th century to the present and includes some of the most important figures of the 20th century, like Babe Ruth in it. You can't understand U.S.-Japanese mm -hmm. relations unless you understand Babe Ruth. I didn't realize how popular Babe Ruth oh, was in Japan yeah. until I read your book. Misha today is going to talk to us about uh, strategic issues in Asia. There's no one better to do this. We're very proud to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Misha. Thank you. <laughs> Jeremy, uh, thanks so much. Thanks for all of you for coming out. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. It's my first time in Austin. It's my first time at the university, but I've always had a uh, a very warm spot in my heart for uh, UT Austin because I really wanted to be a graduate student here. And that did not work out uh, because of a different path that I, I chose to take. But when I was uh, 20 plus years ago looking at uh, places I wanted to go, this was right at the top of my list. So I feel that I heard, check this off the bucket list. I've, I'm here and uh, it's exciting to be with you all and talk a little bit, I guess. And I, I mean, I know this is what Clement Center does. So I hope this is what uh, you guys want and I hope it's going to be value added, but bring you a little bit of the DC mindset. Uh, so I'm not going to talk as, as an academic because I, I no longer really pretend to be one, though I was trained as one and my heart is uh, still with the academy in many ways, but my body is in D.C. And um, D.C. has enough troubles and challenges today that I think anyone in D.C. has to put all of their efforts into really trying to figure out uh, the way forward in an increasingly dangerous world. Which is somewhat ironic when you're talking about Asia, uh, given Ukraine and given ISIS and Iraq and given Iran and given Syria, and you can go off the checklist and name it, trying to talk about the strategic challenges of Asia is a little bit like trying to sell life insurance to a healthy 17-year-old. No one wants to listen to you. They think they're fine. You know, everything's good. It's copacetic. It's specific. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, and you're out there trying to, to get people ahead of the curve, which is the very very last thing DC ever is, is ahead of the curve. I mean, DC by definition is a reactive place. And, and there are good reasons for that. I mean, when you are a status quo power, you are reactive for many good reasons. You are also reactive for many bad reasons. The problem is the world isn't in stasis. And what you find is when you cross into that magical permeable barrier called the beltway, and you get inside the beltway, the presumption in D.C. is that whatever we do here not only is, you know, perfect and important to guide the rest of the country, but we can, we can act as though there are no external influences. I mean, I, I know it's crazy to think of it in that way because everyone in D.C. is saying, well, what do we do about ISIS? Well, what do we do about, what do we do about Ukraine? But the debates themselves in D.C. don't partake of a, a recognition that actually, it's sort of like the Heisenberg principle, right? You, you look at, at something and as you're looking at it, you're moving it just by your very act of looking at it. So we went through 18 months, actually more than 18 months, but I just remember 18 months, 18, 24 months 
of, of the, the, the most incredible angst-ridden discussions on both the right and the left about how much do we cut the military. You know, is it going to be 100 billion a year? Is it going to be 50 billion over 10 years? You know, it, was, it was all over the place. What's it, is it going to be a trillion? What's it going to look like? And never once in any one of those discussions was there a, even a, 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 an angle of the mindset that said, you know, as we're talking about this and doing it, what is actually the effect going to be on the outside world? How does the rest of the world look at this? And I just, I took that as a lesson in how DC gets so consumed with, the, with what it considers to be the process of governing, though I don't think anyone who really would look at the process would think of it as such, but what it considers to be the process of governing versus the policies that it's really adopting and how those are affecting the outside world. And I think, I think you do see it, in, in a, I'm sure you see it with every administration, uh, particularly right now. I think you see it with the Obama administration, which has been so internally focused, for example, on things like Syria. And again, it's, it's, it's odd to think about it because it's an external issue, but so internally focused that there was no perception that if you, for example, draw a red line and then you don't want to enforce it and then you say you're going you're to kick it over to Congress and then you want to give it to the UN and to the Russians, that all of that has effects on the outside. And so that, that is why it's particularly hard to talk about a region like Asia today. And what I'm actually doing right now, and a, a couple of you have asked me, so in addition to writing a, the column for the Wall Street Journal and just whatever else comes to mind and I find particularly interesting at the moment, is trying to finish a, uh, a monograph that right now I'm calling Ocean of Risk. So that's the, the subtitle there, Ocean of Risk, which is not designed for experts. I know all of you guys are, are Asia experts, so it's not designed for you guys, but it is designed for an educated foreign affairs interested and or savvy public to try to explain, number one, why Asia is important. And believe it or not, you have to make that case in DC. You wouldn't think you'd have to, but you do have to make that case in DC. Once you go from that level, it goes down another level of even fewer people who understand what the trends are in Asia. What's actually happening? What, you know, what, what, what is it? What, where's democracy going? Where's militarization going? How strong is economic, uh, the economics of, of the region? You have to sort of try to make that case. Then talk about why all of that is important, and then put it into a context of what does it mean for the United States. So this is a book that will be written for a generalist audience, but, but an audience that it should be thinking about the world, because I would argue that the very long run for the United States, when I say very long run, I don't mean eternity, but you know, the next uh, two generations or so is going to be dependent in terms of our standing and status in the world, our economic health, our political influence, certainly the degree to which we maintain and uphold commitments around the world is going to be tied to Asia. Um, in doing that, you have to break down a lot of different boundaries, uh, again, in DC, but also outside in the way we think about Asia. I don't know how you guys do it here, so hopefully in about 10 seconds you will tell me. But when I was at Yale, you know, we divided it. There was the East Asian, uh, what we call it, East Asian languages and cultures or whatever we called it. Um, then there was South Asian, the, 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 the orphan stepchild is always Southeast Asia. No one really knows, you know, where do you put it in because it's, it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, but uh, you then translate that up to government. We have an assistant secretary of East Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we have a National Security Council director for Asia who deals with essentially East Asia. Um, then you go over to the, the Defense Department and we have an assistant secretary for uh, Asian and Pacific Affairs who actually goes from Japan over to Afghanistan. So we've, we've got all of these different definitions of what Asia is in Washington, but we also, I would argue, have intellectual definitions about what Asia is. When I was doing my studies, I never thought about South Asia, oh, which isn't even on the map here today, which I didn't realize. We're, don't think about it. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm learning. In fact, I just wanted to let you know, this is something what we're trying to do because, by the way, as you know when you'll get outside into the real world, um, uh, media, does, they, no one reads anything uh, anymore. It, it's all got to be visual. So we're just, this was actually a first cut that came out yesterday of trying to figure out how do we visually capture the risk in Asia. And I, I didn't even look at it and realize that India is not on there. However, my definition of Asia is what I call uh, the uh, dynamic crescent. You remember the fertile crescent from uh, you know, ancient Mesopotamia and the Levant and when you studied uh, you know, world history. So there is today a, a, a dynamic crescent that stretches from India, please don't be offended, it's not there, I didn't make the map, India in this huge arc that reaches up to Japan 
and what we used to call the, the Russian Far East or, uh, or um, Pacific Asian Siberia that includes the subcontinent of India. It includes what we consider today to be Southeast Asia. Uh, it, it sweeps up into continental and littoral Asia, including Northeast Asia. And, and I want to make that the frame of reference, in part because if you went out, very unscientific, but if you went out next time you're out at the bar and you just grab someone and say, what is Asia? I will bet you that 85%, maybe 90% will say what we think of as Northeast Asia. Let's say, oh, it's China, Japan, Korea, basically, right? Uh, some may put in Southeast Asia, very few would actually probably put in India. But this is an artificial construct, a map, right? There are no lines on the ground or in the water or, or, or so on when you're there. And if you go there and you travel there, the biggest change in Asia that you've seen is that the Asians themselves, I would argue, all of our friends in Asia in this great uh, dynamic crescent, are thinking of themselves in, in more integrated ways than we have traditionally seen. Although if you want to go really far back in history, it was always much more integrated than in what we take as the period of the nation state, which in itself is so new in Asia. And so the first thing that we need to do, I think, in terms of policy making, in terms of business, in terms of our own approach to Asia, is to expand that frame out. And you have to make the case about why this is so important. One out of every three people on Earth is either Chinese or Indian or, or descended from Chinese and, and Indian immigrants to different countries. Asia is part of your world whether you want it to be or not. And as Americans, we still very much have an Atlanticist mindset. It just is, is in the DNA, both because of the founding of the country, but because of where we put most of our intellectual and governing energies during the 20th century. But the 21st century, I think, is going to be very different. And when you look around the globe, the one area of the globe that has the most opportunity, as well as some of the most significant challenges for the United States, as well as for the world, uh, is Asia. And so I'm trying to capture on a, on a broad front um, the economic, the political domestic, the political foreign, and the security challenges that we're really not paying attention to. So again, if you're looking at ISIS, or you are looking at uh, Ukraine, this looks like one of the most peaceful regions in the world right now. In fact, this is where you sort of want to, you want to put your attention because it looks like we've got nothing but success here. There's no wars, right? There's no beheadings. Uh, there there is, is no country taking over the territory overtly of another country. And so the, the presumption is that we really don't have to pay that much attention. Again, don't forget, you put yourself in that Washington mindset. We will turn to this area when there is a crisis and we need to respond, which is a really, really bad way of doing business. It's the way we do it, but it's a bad way of doing business. But if you peel back the, the layer, if I had sort of, maybe that's how I'll do it next time. You have sort of translucent layers. You remember those old sheets, you guys are probably too young, you used to peel it back and you know, it would show the body and it would show the skin and then the bones and then the, all the organs. But if you peeled this back, like I, I'd have a first layer and it says, Asia's great. Economic growth, freedom is, is on the march, people are doing well and the like. Then you'd peel one layer back and you'd say, well, um, I don't know, maybe North Korea would be our first layer. Things aren't great everywhere because we've got a nuclear North Korea. And then I'd peel back another layer and I'd say, you know, if you're a, a 19th century European historian, the territorial disputes that dot the region, including in my friend India that's not on the map, really are reminiscent of what I'm more familiar with in 19th century Europe before the nation state was settled and the borders were settled and the like. And we have, we have both land border disputes in uh, Korea. We have um, uh, complete entire sort of nation state disputes, for example, with Taiwan. We have island disputes throughout the region of, of varying degrees of intensity, but that are not getting better and not going away. Uh, then I'd peel back another layer and we'd say, okay, political stability isn't taken for granted everywhere because we just have yet another coup in Thailand. Uh, and we can look at other regions that, or other countries that are similarly, though not to the same uh, full extent, unstable like the Philippines. Uh, there were certainly questions about Indonesia it, leading up to, during, and, and immediately after the election and the like. And then I could peel off another layer, for example, and we could talk about uh, China's decision last week to essentially gut the joint, the joint declaration that it signed with Britain in 1984 and not allow free elections in Hong Kong for the chief executive in 2017. So taken together, what I think this does is, is it gives us a, a map. And what I'm actually trying to do in the book, I have no idea if this will work, but when you're at a think tank, you get to you know, sort of play around and have a little bit of fun. I'm tired of, 
actually I'm tired of maps like this. These are, these are very, very boring and everyone tries to figure out how to make them fun. What I want to do in the book is, is create what I'm calling a risk map. Forget the geographic map. What does a risk map of Asia look like? If you were charting out risk regions as though they were countries, what are your big risk regions? And so the ones that I've identified, uh, and, and hopefully I won't forget any of them, but the ones I've identified, number one is the risk, a very large risk region of the failure of economic reform. And that's something we don't really talk about in the United States. We're used to talking about Japan as, you know, will it pull out of its uh, recession that's been going on for 20 years, so on and so forth. But wherever you look in the region, economic growth over the next generation is by no means assured. Economic development is by no means assured. Whether you're a developed country like Japan or South Korea that is facing the problem of transitioning into a post-industrial future with a shrinking population. Whether you are a, a sort of mixed economy like China where you have wealthy enclaves on the coast and much more poverty in the interior uh, and, and enormous problems throughout society. Whether you're a developing country like Indonesia uh, or Vietnam. Each one has a different risk angle with that. The risk angle that Japan has is different from Indonesia's risk angle. But a risk region, to think of it in these terms, is the failure of economic reform, the failure to solve the manifold problems. And so I talk, I talk about them. Another risk region I haven't quite figured out how to deal with entirely yet is demographics. I'm not quite sure where to put it. Uh, but demographics is a different type of risk region because everyone in Asia faces two sides of a demographic problem. They, they adopt one side or the other. Either you have too many people or you have too few people. If you're in Indonesia, if you're in, uh, in India, you have too many people. If you're in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, you have too few people. If you're in China, you've got a lot of people, but you're soon going to start having fewer people. So I'm trying to figure out exactly how we would identify and map out demographics as a risk region because it seems to me to lie in that space between economics and politics. It, it bleeds over into both. Clearly all of the discussion in China about maintaining growth rates while not maintaining growth rates that are too high is to ensure that you continue to bring people up into the middle class, that you provide the, the jobs for the eight million college students who graduate every year, so on and so forth. Um, so you've got an economic problem, but it's also a political problem. Worker dissatisfaction and unrest, people who are demanding more local autonomy and the like. It, it sits somewhere in the middle, and so I'm trying to figure out maybe if we were thinking of a 19th century European map, it's a little bit like Alsace-Lorraine, right? It sits in between two great powers, but it is, it's, it in, in itself is, is somewhat of a, um, it's an independent variable, but it is one that, that you don't treat by itself because of its spillover effects. Which then leads us into the, the next big risk region, which is what I'm calling unfinished political revolution throughout the region. And I know it's a little bit uh, odd to think of, because you look at Japan, uh, seems to be pretty settled, seems like South Korea's turned the corner and the like. Um, certainly, if you look at China, you would say, well, the, the, the revolution's over, uh, the communists won, and you know, they're keeping hold on power. But as a historian, this is where it's very dangerous to be a historian in DC, I've learned, you know, you're always aware of the, 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 the unending flow of history. Nothing's ever done. DC wants it done. You know, pass that budget, everything's done. Let's you know, start afresh. It's hard to think that way. But it seems to me that, that you could conceive of another very large risk region in Asia as the unfinished political revolutions. Again, with everyone having a slightly different angle. So in Japan, I think it's an open question to be honest, to be really you know, sort of on the edge radical about it, uh, whether democracy in Japan will succeed. I mean, if you are going into 20 plus years of economic stagnation, a swing in the electorate giving all the power to one party and then to another power in a party in a desperate hope to solve your, your economic problems and ensure that you have a, a stable social future, if you have a sort of tapped out electorate that is extremely cynical and no longer believes that tomorrow is going to be better than it is today, I'm certainly not willing to say that you know, the game of, of democratic evolution in Japan has changed. There could be some guy on a white horse waiting to ride in. It's happened before in the past. But that's how a, a, the problem of mature economies and mature societies have to deal with that. On the other hand, China. By no means, I think, could we argue that the Chinese revolution is finished. I mean, is, is it finished in terms of who governs today? Yes. But is that the end and end all and be all of Chinese history? Of course not. And in fact, I think that's why Hong Kong is so important. 
The decision about Hong Kong is so important because it was a message that certain types of evolution are not going to be allowed in territory that China considers its own or is controlled by China. And Beijing, which has for years wooed Taipei, had absolutely no qualms about having that message sent as clearly and as brusquely as possible. So if you're Taiwanese and you're thinking, you yeah, know, how close do we want to get? Do, you know, is, is it going to be okay? Could we maintain our style of life and have a, um, have a uh, you know, the, uh, sort of a Hong Kong style, one country, two systems? That announcement last week should have sent shivers up and down your spine, and Beijing didn't care. But it seems to me that by no means is, is the, the political revolution in Beijing uh, in China finished. And it's much easier when you look at Thailand, that's obviously going on today. You look at newer countries that are struggling with opening up what seem to be effective democratic processes to true competition. For example, Singapore. For example, Malaysia. Uh, Indonesia seems like it's turned the corner. Nonetheless, it, it, is an, it is an ongoing risk area, I would argue, because we are, as uh, a famous U.S. president once said, only one generation away from tyranny every time. It's harder to think of that here at home. It's a lot easier to think about it when you look at the potential of um, military intervention, for example, or a much shorter historical period in which the, the benefits of democracy have been understood, accepted, and debated by a populace versus the question of very quick fixes. Isn't it better to have a quick fix? And, and, you know, and this sort of boils down into that large question of, you know, is Asia's future free or is it authoritarian? Which system works better? That's one way of looking at it. I'd like to put it in this, this large risk, um, this risk environment, this, this risk region. That leads to a third one, however, one that is, is sort of increasingly intertwined with it, which is the risk of a, a lack of effective regional political mechanisms. So you've got the risk of domestic politics, but you have the risk of foreign politics as well. For Americans, I think it's, it's often very hard, not for you guys because you deal with it, but it's often very hard to look at Asia and say, well, why isn't it like Europe? Uh, maybe not the Europe of right now because that doesn't look so great, but why isn't it, why isn't it Europe? Why doesn't it have a, a NATO? Why doesn't it have an EU? Why doesn't it have um, even a UN, though it's global, but you know, we very much think of it in, in, uh, in the, sort of European Atlanticist terms. Why can't they all just get along, to, to, you know, to use another phrase? Um, and compared to 20 years ago, there's much more of that. But if you want to look at it in terms of functional levels, there's very little that ties the Asian nations together in ways that we think of that sort of stable, settled regions work. You know, there, there's no more fear about a Franco-Russian war, right? And there's no more questioning over who owns Alsace-Lorraine or who solved the Schleswig-Holstein problem, right? But in, in Asia, right now you have Japanese and Chinese planes and boats facing off against each other, sometimes daily, but repeatedly, and they've been doing it for years. You have down in the South China Sea the same thing. And again, I'll, I'll talk about the security in a second, but what we, what we see from there and what we see from, from all of this interaction is that there are no political mechanisms. It's a huge risk region. If you go to Jakarta, and you're, you're going to be stuck in traffic, so you have a lot of time as you very slowly inch your way down the main boulevard. But eventually you'll see this building hidden behind trees and, and, and high, uh, you know, wrought iron fences. That's the headquarters of ASEAN. And it's, almost, it's just a, it's a perfect, is it a metaphor? I don't know what it is. A perfect symbol. symbol. Thank you. That's it. I, don't, I can't use those terms. It's a perfect symbol of how ineffective ASEAN is at the end of the day. It's in, in some ways, it's the only game in town. It's the, the sort of convener, and it's got all these different sub-mechanisms going on, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six, ASEAN regional forum. But ASEAN's headquarters are hidden behind this grove of trees in the middle of downtown Jakarta, and if you blink, you'll miss it. And I think that reflects the weakness of the intra-regional political ties, and that's an enormous risk region to me. Um, and one that, as Americans, we find it very frustrating because we think, you know, we should be able, the president, I give him all the credit for doing so, said when he came into office, we're going we're gonna to be back in Asia, right? And, and he's going to go to ASEAN. Now, he's missed a couple of the meetings, but he went. He went to the East Asian Summit. He went to ASEAN. That was fantastic. The problem is, in, in our thinking as Americans, once you get there, you know, that's where the problems get solved, right? You know, it's, it's a high-level meeting of all, the, of all, the, uh, of all the, the leaders of the region. And we think of it like we think of a G7, or we think of it like we think of an EU meeting, and it's very much not. And it's going to take decades, at a minimum, 
before it actually becomes that, but my betting is that it actually won't. That leads me naturally into the last risk region. I think I've covered them all. The last risk region, which is security. Very uh, easier one to understand. Uh, it is one that Washington can, Washington can understand it better. We, Washington understands, you know, when there's the risk of war or there's, there's a conflict or, or something like that. Uh, Washington understands what happens when you've got the potential of, you know, Japanese and Chinese ships facing off each other or Chinese ships taking over territory in the South China Sea as they did with the Scarborough Shoal and the Second Thomas Shoal and, and the like. The real danger, so it's, a, it's an easy risk region to, to map out on this risk map. The, the, what worries me about it, and the reason I think we need to pay attention to it, is that by no calculation that I can see, certainly not one that I as a dispositionally pessimistic, conservative, you know, um, historian of, of world history can see, by no means is any of this getting better. Now again, our presumption, I think our operating system, um, privileges the idea that over time problems often get worked out. You know, you get bad hiccups like World War II or World War I or things like that. But in general, you know, we have a very Whiggish view of history. Things get better. People learn to live together. You get better, more effective organizations. Um, it's, it's in the immediate short-term diplomatic side, it's what I call uh, the dialogue dependency trap. We feel we must continue talking. If we just do it one more time, they're going to understand us and they're going to share our worldview. We say that every single time we, we're, we get involved with North Korea. It's like Lucy and Charlie Brown in the football. North Korea is Lucy, we're Charlie Brown. The nuclear negotiations are the football and she yanks it away every time and we land up flat on our back and say, next time I'm going to kick that football. We're doing it with Iran, I would argue. We do it over and over and over. But it's because of a, a, a deeper system uh, my son who's big into computers can tell me what all these subroutines are and all these things that I don't know what they mean, but there's a deeper operating system by which we presume a rationality on the part of our interlocutors, our adversaries, our opponents, our partners, that they're going to follow along with our understanding of how rational people sit down and work out, work out their problems. It's not happening. Now, I, I mentioned a risk region is, one of the risk regions is because of this uh, uh, lack of effective mechanisms, but by any accounting, the security equation in Asia is getting worse. It's not getting better. And, and I'll end up here because I know I want to get to your questions. It's much more interesting than me talking. But, um, but what's interesting to me is the U.S. effect. And so, by the way, and then the, end, the last part of the book is, so what should the U.S. do about it? This is you know, a whole host of raft of ideas about why we should get involved, why it's important for the U.S. to get involved because of our, our connections, our ties, our economic, uh, our economic stake, and so on and so forth. But it's very interesting to me to look at, at particularly this last region, the security region, uh, which is probably one that gets the most attention in Washington, uh, and look at, at why has the U.S. acted the way it has. Now, I think that the case can be made, by the way, that the U.S., what I'm about to say about the U.S. can be said about the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and it can be said about the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis ISIS and Syria and so on and so forth. But I started off by saying, at the beginning, a, um, a status quo power is a risk-averse power. And I believe that to be true. And there are good reasons for it and there are bad reasons for it. But there, there are good reasons for it. But when you're a risk-averse power, and particularly when you are a risk-averse power, that is coming off of a 13-year, unique 13-year military engagement in the Middle East, you're particularly risk averse. And the presumption, particularly I would again say in dealing with, for example, a country like China, big, important, powerful, important to us, is that wherever you want to chart your risk level, 1 to 100, 1 to 11, whatever you want to call it, you're going to put a dot and the presumption in Washington is that if I get involved at this point where I think I am today, I can make the situation worse. You hear that all the time, by the way, with regard to China. We don't want to antagonize China. We don't want to cause you know, China to lash out. We don't want to feel, we don't want to make them feel like they're backed into a corner or encircled or whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Um, so your, your presumption is you've plotted it and you think if you then get involved at this point, you will cause the risk curve to, to worsen instead as is, I guess, common now in D.C., we say we want to bend the curve downwards, right? So the presumption is by not getting involved, by not pushing people into a corner, by not challenging them, by trying to work these other methods, your risk graph will actually go downwards. 
right? So that six months out, a year, five years out, you were here. Now you can chart that our risk level is here. Our risk level has declined. And so you don't get involved. The problem is we made the wrong bet. We decided not to get involved here, and by any objective measure, I would argue, the risk curve has gone up through lack of American involvement. And so now, I'm not saying we're up here, we're not at 11 yet, but you know, maybe we're about here. The problem is that hits your feedback loop, where you say, okay, this hasn't gone the way I've wanted. There's no way we can say that the Senkakus and the Spratleys and the Paracels, and quite frankly, Hong Kong, and all these things have gone the way we wanted. And, I, and I'm not saying we invade. Don't, that's not what I'm talking about. But if we do decide we now want to get involved here, we are at a higher level of risk. So the, by the time you do decide to get involved, your risk curve has gone the wrong way. You now have a higher level of risk of getting involved. We do that all through American history. Different reasons, different times. We did it in the 1930s. We did it in the 1990s. We're doing it right now. And we see that often these problems don't resolve themselves. So you make a bet that you can rationally bring your risk curve down when in reality, often, not always, but often the risk curve is going up. That's my fear about Asia. So the final takeaway for me, why is it so important to talk about Asia today? Because we want to truncate, cut off, and cap this risk cycle from getting worse. We didn't do it with ISIS and Iraq and Syria. We didn't do it with Ukraine. Today, we don't have those types of crises in Asia, but if you want to plot where your risk curve is going, I think it's going up. And if we don't get involved, the problem is, how far does it go? And at what point do we say, regardless of the risk, we have to get involved? Is it an attack on an ally? Is it a clash between armies? We don't know what it is. But by not getting involved, I think involved, and there's a big area of how you get involved, but by not getting involved, we assure that the risk curve goes up. So, that's a little bit what I'm trying to do and a little bit try to head off the DC reactionary cycle by getting people interested and informed uh, and hopefully passionate about why, why Asia is so important to our future, but also why we should be thinking a lot more about which way we want that future to go. So I'll stop there and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thanks.